on September 26th, the XP-59A rolled out into the sunlight for the first time. In all but two regards, it appeared to be a very conventional design. A single-place, mid-wing fighter resting low on its tricycle landing gear. But of course, it wasn't conventional. There wasn't any prop. And tucked beneath the wings, along the fuselage, were a pair of nacelles housing the IA engines. Those engines roared to life for the first time on the aircraft that day. And by September 30th, just four days later, Bob Stanley and the airplane were primed for its initial taxi tests. After completing some low-speed trials, he proceeded to a series of high-speed runs in order to get a feel for the controls. On a couple of these runs, toward late afternoon, the wheels of the aircraft actually lifted a couple of feet off the ground. Stanley, a brilliant engineer and a relentlessly hard-driving personality who seldom counted patience among his virtues, was all for making the first flight then and there. Larry Bell, however, would have none of it. High-ranking official observers weren't due in for two more days. On the following day, October 1st, Stanley made four additional high-speed taxis, during the first of which, the XP-59 leapt some 25 feet off the surface of the lake bed. And on subsequent runs, it climbed to as high as 100 feet that day. Unofficially, the XP-59A had unquestionably flown. But the brass hadn't been there to see it, so officially, it hadn't really happened. Finally, on October 2nd, the brass was on hand. At about one in the afternoon, Stanley advanced the throttles, released the brakes, and slowly at first, the aircraft moved across the hard-baked clay. After what seemed like an unusually long takeoff roll, its wheels finally left the ground, and less than 13 months after commencing the project, America had officially entered the jet age. GE's Ted Rogers, who'd come cross-country with the airplane on the Red Ball Express, reported what he called a strange feeling as he watched the flight. Dead silence as it passed directly overhead. Then a low, rumbling roll, like a blowtorch, and it was gone, leaving a smell of kerosene in the air. Others also saw the flight, and what appeared to be a trail of smoke coming from the airplane. Lieutenant Dodd got a call from the training base across the lake bed. An excited voice asked if he needed a fire truck. I'm sure we can handle it, he calmly replied. The visible smoke in the jet's exhaust was actually the product of incomplete combustion of the kerosene fuel. After Stanley had completed a second flight up to about 10,000 feet, he turned to Colonel Lawrence C. Bill Craigie, chief of experimental aircraft projects for the material division and indicated that they only had about a half hour of running time left on the engines before they'd have to be pulled for inspection. And he wondered if Craigie would like to take it up. Craigie had been involved in management of the program, but he wasn't really a test pilot, and he'd come to Muroc only as an observer. But as he later recalled, Stanley didn't have to ask him twice. During his flight, recreated here by artist Mike Bichotte, he reported, as virtually all who followed him would, I didn't get very high, I didn't go very fast. The most vivid impression I received after a very long takeoff run occurred at the moment we broke contact from the ground. It was so quiet. In an age when, as Craigie now recalls it, the flight test business was a lot less formal. He'd become America's first military jet pilot, quite by happenstance. His observation about the differences between flight testing then and now were well illustrated by the XP-59A program. There were no safety chase planes, for example, and the most important instrumentation remained the seat of the pilot's pants. Not too scientific, but by latter-day standards, relatively inexpensive, and it afforded a means of real-time data acquisition which was sure to yield immediate analyses of any problems. The aircraft was ultimately instrumented to cover about 20 different parameters. 
The instrumentation was primitive, to say the least. Control stick forces, for example, were measured with a modified fish scale. An engine thrust by means of a spring scale attached to the landing gear and anchored to the ground. There was no telemetry. This was the mission control center. A two-way radio and an old voice recorder to capture the pilot's comments. It may not seem state-of-the-art, but when rains flooded the lake bed and the test team had to temporarily relocate, it proved to be eminently portable. A couple of the test aircraft were ultimately modified to provide an open cockpit observation seat so someone could sit in front and read and record the data. Probably the only jet aircraft ever to offer such exhilarating aircrew accommodations. They provided a lot of ground personnel with their first and doubtlessly scintillating exposure to jet flight. Even Larry Bell, who had developed an intense fear of flying, couldn't resist the opportunity although he looked none too thrilled about it. It was an age when, without the benefit of vast technical resources, improvisation and old-fashioned mother wit still ruled supreme. Sitting in the cockpit, the XP-59 did seem incredibly quiet. And unlike piston engine airplanes, its ride was unbelievably smooth. The engines ran so smoothly, in fact, that the cockpit instrumentation tended to stick because of the lack of vibration. What to do? A resourceful technician mounted a doorbell mechanism, seen here on the upper left-hand corner, which functioned as a panel vibrator and solved the problem for less than two dollars. Improvisation also carried over to security. Whenever the airplane was in a location where uncleared personnel might possibly catch a glimpse of it, a dummy wooden prop always graced its nose.